Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. The City of Lethbridge has a new brand. City officials say the new look will bridge both the past and the future. The City of Calgary will not be following the province's lead when it comes to eliminating mandatory masks on July 1st. And our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari has details of military summer camps for kids. Kids who are taught to build bombs. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Robbins. Thanks so much for joining us. Bill C-6, which would amend the criminal code to ban conversion therapy, just passed in the House of Commons. It bans advertising or collecting money for conversion therapy. It would also make it illegal to force a youth to undergo the practice. The vote adopted at third reading was 263 yeas to 63 nays. Most of the nays came from the Conservative Party of Canada. A National Parole Board heard the impassioned pleas of Paul Bernardo's victims and turned down the convicted Ontario rapist and killer's request for parole. This is the second time in three years Bernardo has been denied parole. Bernardo is serving a life sentence in the deaths of Kristen French and Leslie Mahaffey. He was also convicted of manslaughter in the death of Tammy Hamalka, the younger sister of Carla Hamalka. Bernardo's crimes in the 1980s and early 90s included kidnapping, torturing and killing the two teenagers near St. Catharines, Ontario. Bernardo, who's now 56, was convicted along with his wife Carla Hamalka in 1995. Hamalka was released from prison in 2005 after serving time. Alberta government officials will be studying a new report submitted on Alberta's helicopter emergency medical services. The report brought forth a wide range of recommendations, including that STARS Air Ambulance would become the dedicated helicopter emergency medical service provider for the entire province. STARS would then work with other providers, including HALO and HERO, to ensure consistent coverage across Alberta. Provincial funding for STARS would increase from 23 to 50 percent of their operating budget. Currently, AHS provides $8.4 million a year to helicopter emergency medical services funding. The province says around 1,450 helicopter flights take place each year providing emergency services. The Alberta government announced today that it is being proactive to ensure Albertans continue to have access to clean drinking water while protecting our province's fish. Officials are asking for public input regarding new surface water quality management frameworks for the North Saskatchewan, Battle and Upper Athabasca Rivers. The province will also be launching a selenium management review to ensure our water quality is protected. These objectives are set in collaboration with stakeholders, Indigenous communities, municipalities and the public to ensure they can reliably support water needs for the community, aquatic habitat and the economy in the region into the future. Regular water monitoring, evaluation and reporting on ambient surface water quality conditions ensures the objectives of the frameworks are being met. I want to highlight that under these frameworks, once water quality objectives are set, they must be achieved. This means if any water quality trigger or limit is exceeded, the framework will require a management response from government. This level of oversight helps us better understand the cumulative effects of various activities on the landscape, which is essential to making informed decisions in the future about land and water management and resource development. The province has come under fire recently in regards to coal mining in the eastern slopes of the Canadian Rockies and how that mining may be impacting our water quality. Premier Jason Kenney's official announcement that anyone who received the COVID-19 vaccine could be eligible to win some big prizes may have some Albertans excited, but according to legal consultant David Dixon, there could also be some legal issues surrounding a lottery such as this. I would say legally questionable at best. Under Section 206 of the Criminal Code, um, there are some conditions around uh, games of chance, and this is effectively a game of chance. Um, there are definite uh, expectations around uh, who can enter, who, who can be excluded, and the only real exclusion uh, would be somebody who uh, was underage to participate in a lottery. Um, Section 207 clarifies that under the Criminal Code. Um, but from my reading of everything in there, this lottery doesn't conform to the criminal code's expectations. David Dixon is a former UK police officer and a legal consultant for both the RCMP and the Blood Tribe Police. And our poll question this week centers around the province completely reopening on Canada Day. Do you agree with the Alberta government moving out of stage three and removing almost all COVID-19 restrictions on July 1st? 
Log on to our website, bridgecitynews.ca, and let us know your thoughts. We'll tabulate the results and have them for you on Friday evening's newscast. The City of Lethbridge has a new look and a new logo. The change is designed to help build community pride while attracting new visitors, investors, and business owners to our city. As Carson Marsuki explains, the revamp has been in the works for over a year. This is one of the most beautiful cities in Alberta, if not the most beautiful city in Alberta. That's why the city of Lethbridge revealed a new, fresh, modern logo and brand on Tuesday. The current logo has been used since 1907, and city officials say it was time to modernize it, helping attract more people, including students, residents, and businesses, to the city. Mayor Chris Spearman says people passing through Lethbridge aren't able to get a full look at what the city has to offer. They see the coolies, they see the river valley, they see the university. Uh, ver some of the very first things they see about our city. And then when they explore a little bit, they learn about our parks. The new logo introduced is made up of three symbols to represent the city. The tall part located on the left-hand side is to represent the increase of buildings across Lethbridge. And then the, the section coming out of the L sort of shows that forward-looking perspective. It mimics our roads, our pathways, it mimics the bridge here, that perspective going forward. And then obviously the little swoop underneath being the water, the river, movement, also a tie back to the traditional Blackfoot lands. However, the city crest will continue to be used as the official coat of arms for the mayor and council. The city will transition to the new branding when it makes operational and financial sense to do so and won't have an impact on taxpayers. It's not going to be throwing out every crest that exists out there and, and replacing it because that doesn't make any sense. And, and that crest is still going to be a part of our history. The new brand was built on community and stakeholder research already completed through the development of the Lethbridge Community brand in 2018, as well as it aligns with the Brighter Together and Downtown Lethbridge brands. The new logo was released on the same day as Lethbridge's high-level train bridge right behind me turns 112 years old. For Bridge City News, I'm Carson Marsuk. Another candidate for Lethbridge City Council has thrown his hat in the ring. Nick Palladino says he has the experience people are looking for since he worked for Lethbridge County for over 30 years. Micah Quinn has the details. Nick Palladino is self-funding his campaign for councillor this year. In 2017, he finished 10th out of 29 candidates. Palladino says his platform for 2021 is going to focus on controlled spending. The city uh, needs to realize that uh, we can't pay for everything and I'd, I'd like to see uh, those things that we need um, funded rather than the things that we want. The promotion of new businesses is also one of Palladino's top priorities for his campaign. Well, I think the city's trying very hard to, to, to promote Lethbridge as a, as a business centre. Uh, you know, the industrial area is a good place to start. These, these businesses out here pay a lot of taxes, and those are the types of clean industrial and commercial businesses that we'd like to see located in Lethbridge. In 2019, the city of Lethbridge acquired the Lethbridge Airport, and Palladino says the airport needs a new government model, as a lot of the area is underutilized and underdeveloped. Uh, so I think they need to set up a, an airport authority that the prime focus of that airport authority would be to generate uh, business out there and traffic out there. Palladino is also in support of a third river crossing for the city, which would add on to Highway 3 and Whoop Up Drive. Years ago, um, I think it was the uh, city engineers themselves that said when the city hit 100, we wouldn't need a third bridge until the city hit 100,000. Well, everybody knows the city's over 100,000 now, so we don't have a third bridge. Um, I think that's something I would really pr help promote. For more information on Palladino's campaign, you can visit nickpalladino.com. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Adding to the list of names vying for a seat on City Council is Jen Prosser. Jen is the Executive Director of the Lethbridge Public Interest Research Group, which is a nonprofit organization that advocates for social and environmental justice. One of her key priorities is to make childcare more affordable. We have a ton of organizations and agencies in the city doing that work already. So we need to sit down to figure out what does the city need to do to make these things um, more centralized, more comprehensive, to expand some of these services. So when we're talking about childcare, we have great childcare providers. We have the Boys and Girls Club, which does amazing work. We have the YMCA, does amazing work. So let's work with them and let's look at the money being offered that's on the table by the federal government and let's bring it to Lethbridge. Prosser also wants to look at ways to make housing and transit more affordable here in our city. Many businesses in Alberta are really looking forward to fully reopening to customers when the province enters stage three of their open for summer plan. Lethbridge Chamber of Commerce CEO Cindy Voss says that business owners are going to need to go through an adjustment stage once they fully reopen. 
we're used to having limited capacity and and serving people at, a, at in a different manner than than what traditionally we have but being a knowing that you can just go to work open your door and serve your customers or your clients or whoever whatever you do in your business the the excitement is just uh, i don't know if there's really words to explain the excitement Boss says that business owners will still be following practices that will make visiting their establishments a safe experience for all of their customers. Masculinity. Now, it's a word that some men struggle with. Lethbridge Family Service is offering a free workshop called Man Up, which will talk about the impact that socially constructed gender roles have on the well-being of males here in our city. Corinne Jansen, the Outreach and Education Facilitator for Lethbridge Family Services, says this workshop takes a critical examination of the characteristics of how men are looked at in today's society. Um, we talk about the man box, so kind of the um, what a man has to be and um, characteristics that are expected of men and how that can affect um, mental health, how it can affect um, relationships with other people, um, and things like that. We try to create a safe space and like let everybody know in the group we're all at different understandings of what masculinity means and what the social construct is around it. The workshop with Lethbridge Family Services will run online on June 25th. The Tabor police have seen it all, but when officers responded to a call last week, they encountered a pesky situation. A baby raccoon had crawled up inside of a truck wheel well and was stuck. That's when the owner of the truck called the Tabor Police Service to assist. Community Standards Officer Todd Boychuk says it was the first type of a call regarding a raccoon for the police service. By the time we got to the vehicle, the uh, little guy had crawled into the um, kind of behind the engine block. And it was pretty difficult to get the little guy out. So we popped the hood, looked under there. We tried to coax it out with a blanket, but we were able to snag him and pull him out once he uh, wasn't leaving on his own. Once we got him out, we were able to wrap him up in a blanket, get the snare off of him and put him in a bucket. And then from there, uh, we were able to just take him off to a wooded area that was nearby that he would be able to you know, thrive in and uh, his natural habitat. Tabor Police would like to remind people the importance of checking around your vehicle for any possible objects or dangers that may be in the way before driving away. Three people are believed to have been attacked by the same coyote in separate instances in northwest Calgary. They all occurred in the Nolan Hill area with the latest attack happening on Saturday when a woman in her 60s was taken to hospital. The city says the two-year-old animal will be trapped and euthanized. City officials say it's the safest and quickest option. The city of Calgary will not be following provincial recommendations on the mandatory wearing of masks when all COVID-19 health restrictions are lifted on July 1st. After a lengthy meeting Monday night, Council adopted an amended recommendation to keep the mandatory mask bylaw in place until July the 5th. At that time, Council will consider hospitalizations, infection rates, and second-dose vaccinations are safe enough for the bylaw to be repealed. The city administration had recommended the bylaw remain in place until July 31st. RCMP say two Roman Catholic churches on First Nations reserves in B.C. have burned to the ground. One fire occurred at the Sacred Heart Church on the Penticton Indian Band Reserve yesterday morning. Another was reported less than two hours later at St. Gregory's Church located on the Osoyoos Indian Band Reserve. The Mountie say police are working with both the Penticton and Osoyoos Indian Bands as part of the investigation. The Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs is applauding the province's commitment to spend $2.5 million to fund searches for children's remains at former residential schools. Grand Chief Arlen Dumas calls the funding a good first step. Premier Brian Pallister says the discovery of what are believed to be the remains of 215 children at a former residential school in B.C. has deeply felt in Manitoba, which had 17 residential schools. Pallister adds the effort to find and honour the grave sites must be led by Indigenous people, especially those who survived residential schools. Manitoba has reached its COVID-19 vaccination target for the first stage of reopening 10 days ahead of its goal of Canada Day. The province's chief medical officer of health says more than 25% of residents aged 12 and up are now fully vaccinated after the province surpassed the 70% mark for first doses. Dr. Brent Rusin says more details on the possibility of moving up the first stage of reopening can be expected on Wednesday. Whether it's vaccine rates, whether it's test positivity, whether it's uh, hospital admissions, we don't look at just one indicator when we're taking these things in consideration. Uh, so yes, we met those uh, vaccine targets. 
And, um, you know, so hats off to the, the vaccine task force and Manitobans uh, for, getting, uh, for getting their shots. Uh, but that's only one thing that we're considering when we're, when we're looking at our reopen plan. So we, we do have to look at these numbers. We have to look at that strain on the healthcare system and, and really put that all together for, um, you know, how we could uh, open up uh, in, a, uh, in a safe manner. Health officials say Manitoba was late to the third wave of the pandemic and will be watching other provinces as they reopen to see whether there is a new surge in cases. Canada is a step closer to producing homegrown vaccines. Construction is complete at the Biologics Manufacturing Centre in Montreal, which will be able to produce around 24 million COVID-19 vaccine doses each and every year. The National Research Council of Canada is working with Novavax to produce a vaccine there. Equipment is still being installed and the site is not yet fully licensed and operational. While many children here in North America are heading off to summer camp to learn how to canoe, maybe do some archery, enjoy arts and crafts, there's summer military camps being run by Hamas and other parts of the world which are teaching how to make bombs and instilling hatred, in particular the hatred of Jews. Our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari has the details. It is such a startling story, not just these summer camps, but their textbooks and the songs they sing as kids, as toddlers. They are taught about becoming martyrs and killing Jews and bloodshed. Spilling the blood of the enemy is a quote that's repeated very often in these songs. And to take these young children and to fill their minds with so much hatred at such a young age and then expect them as adults, you know, to make peace with their neighbors, to live side by side, to acknowledge a Jewish state of Israel, it's almost impossible possible. Lisa will also discuss how the new Israeli Prime Minister is warning the United States to wake up before rejoining the Iran nuclear talks. That informative interview is coming up in the second half of our program. A gunman is believed to have shot and killed an officer and another person in a shopping district in a Denver, Colorado suburb on Monday. The shooter was then shot and killed by police. At about 1.15 this afternoon, an Arvada officer responded to a call of a suspicious incident in the Old Town Square near the Arvada Library. Just after 1.30, we received 911 calls about shots fired and that an officer had been hit by gunfire. A veteran officer with the Arvada Police Department was shot and killed. One other person was transported to an area hospital. At this time, we believe this person was shot and killed by the gunman. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the victims, family, and friends. One suspect has also been shot and killed, and his identity will be released by the coroner's office. The van that crashed Saturday in Alabama carrying children ages 4 through 17 were being cared for at a youth home which takes in abused and neglected children. Alabama Youth Homes Chief Executive says the community is grieving the loss. I know that we lost eight of our children. <clears throat> That's what I know. They're on their way back. Our lead van, which was a few miles in front of the other, had nine passengers. And when they got in between Fort Deposit and Greenville, they were involved in a horrific accident. Um, we had nine passengers. We had eight fatalities and one survivor. We're in a state of grief right now, um, and there's a lot of healing that needs to be done. You know, in the Bible it says that God won't put anything on us that we can't handle, and um, we've questioned that quite a bit these past few days, but God's got big shoulders, and, and we know that our only way to get through the grief that we have right now is with prayer. Yeah, those families definitely need our prayers. It was a great day for a barbecue or a walk along Henderson Lake here in Lethbridge, and the forecast is calling for more summer-like conditions to continue. Full weather details are coming up. Something I really enjoy about the summer, the many colorful birds you get a chance to see, especially here in southwestern Alberta and across the province. Now, here are a couple of beautiful pictures of mountain bluebirds sent to us from Linda Gaimonat in west central Alberta near Hinton. Thanks so much for sending in the pictures, Linda. It's a beautiful bird. Not just the birds, but we've all been enjoying the hot summer days lately. Jeanette Rocher is back with all of the weather details. Jeanette, it'll be kind of a mixed bag this week, scorching hot temperatures and a little bit of rain as well. 
Yeah, that's right. We could actually see 60% chance of showers on Wednesday night into Thursday. Uh, that's basically it, though. The rest of the week looking warm and sunny, so that could be a nice little reprieve there in the middle of the week. So into tomorrow as we look to Wednesday, 27 the high, a mix of sun and cloud, like I was saying, those showers starting Wednesday evening overnight into Thursday. 22 is what the temperature will drop to on Thursday and then climb back up again on Friday for 28 degrees up to 31 on Saturday, 34 for Sunday and all the way up to 35 for next Monday. Uh, we could be seeing some record breakers on a Sunday or Monday, so we will certainly have to be watching for that. Of course, we're going to be way higher than this uh, 23 seasonal high for this time of year. Uh, average low for this time of year, 9 degrees. 35 was our high temperature on this day back in 1941. And we had our lowest in 1963, which was 4 degrees. Sun rose this morning. It's 524 a.m. sunset this evening, 943 p.m. So we're still sitting at uh, that 16 hours and 19 minutes of daylight, giving us some of the longest stretch of daylight in the entire year. So compare that to six months ago. Our days are more than twice as long. 22 on the coast tomorrow. Victoria, sunshine, mix of sun and cloud, Vancouver. Edmonton and Calgary, both pretty nice days. Sunshine in Edmonton with, uh, with a high of 24 four degrees, 22 the high in Calgary, uh, not too much cloud coverage. Over in the rest of the prairies here, we're looking at a chance of showers, 30% chance of showers in Saskatoon, risk of a thunderstorm in the afternoon, 25 degrees the high, 27 the high in Regina with a mix of sun and cloud, 29 the high in Winnipeg, also under partly cloudy skies. Should be a warm one over there. Speaking of warm, we're looking at sunny and 24 tomorrow in Toronto, a beautiful 22 degrees tomorrow in Ottawa with sunny skies, sunshine also in Montreal with a high of 22 degrees. Now we're going to see a little bit more rain activity on the east coast, particularly with that tropical cyclone uh, statement in effect still with Claudette uh, barreling towards the east coast where she's kind of uh, in her ending stages now, but bringing with it lots of rain particularly to Halifax. There we go. Uh, we're looking at lots of rain overnight in Halifax. Should be ending tomorrow morning though. 21 the high there. 22 in Fredericton, 19 in Charlottetown. Expecting quite a bit of rain there. Some rain showers also expected in St. John's, Newfoundland tomorrow with some fog and some wind. 24 the high there in St. John's. So there you go. That is your forecast. Today's weather is brought to you by Jeff Reimer of Royal LePage South Country Real Estates. 403 380-1779. Nissan's chief executive is pleading for patience from upset shareholders. Makoto Uchida is also promising a turnaround at the Japanese automaker, which is projecting a third year of losses as it struggles to distance itself from a scandal over its former chairman, Carlos Ghosn. At a recent shareholders meeting, one shareholder demanded a detailed disclosure of Ghosn's alleged wrongdoing, saying questions about governance remain unanswered. The Oklahoma-based automaker has been struggling in recent years. Its brand image was battered by the 2018 arrest of Ghosn over various financial misconduct allegations. A huge oil refinery in the U.S. Virgin Islands has announced that it is shutting down indefinitely. Lime Tree Bay energy contaminated the environment in a series of events that sickened many and forced schools to close. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency suspended its petroleum refining and processing operations last month. The refinery said it will lay off more than 270 workers by September because it faces extreme financial constraints. When it comes to the local economy here in southwestern Alberta, some regions are doing slightly better than others. That's according to Trevor Lewington with Economic Development Lethbridge. Lewington says a big reason is that some areas are more heavily reliant on the oil and gas sectors, while others are not. We see economic data, for example, from cities like Medicine Hat that we know is struggling a little bit more so than we are. They're a little bit more reliant on oil and gas, as an example. Lethbridge has a slightly more diversified economy. But the surrounding region, everything that we've seen so far, it seems to be pretty positive. Most municipal governments received extra funding last year from the provincial government that should help municipalities. And we haven't seen any major closures or major sort of economic changes in the surrounding region. So, so far, so good. Mr. Lewington will have more detail of how the Alberta economy is bouncing back post-pandemic. That Q&A with Jeanette Roche is coming up later in our broadcast. Now is a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 44 points in the day to finish at 20,201. The Dow was up 68 points to 33,946. 
The S&P 500 was up 21 points to 4246, and the Nasdaq was up 111 on the day to 14,253. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 60 cents to 7306 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 7 cents to 326 US. Gold was up 4 cents to 177878 US an ounce, and silver was even at 2578 US an ounce. Wheat is at $340 per metric ton. Barley's also at $340, canola's at $705, and corn is at $400 per metric ton. Live cattle were up 213 to 123.10, feeder cattle were up 325 to 158.35, and lean hogs were up 48 cents to 107.53. The Canadian dollar was even on the day at 81.26 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, Canada is a step closer to producing homegrown vaccines. Construction is complete at the Biologics Manufacturing Centre in Montreal, which will be able to produce around 24 million COVID-19 vaccine doses each and every year. The National Research Council of Canada is working with Novavax to produce a vaccine there. Equipment is still being installed and the site is not yet fully licensed and operational. While our kids go to summer camp to learn about arts and crafts, there are some children in other parts of the world who are being taught to build bombs by Hamas to attack Israel. Our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari will have the chilling details for us in just a moment. Nuclear talks between Iran and world leaders has adjourned. Was it a very successful meeting? To discuss this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari joining once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, new Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett warns the U.S. to wake up before rejoining the Iran nuclear deal talks. Oh, yeah. So they've gotten this warning from, from many, many people. Of course, the Israelis being one of the more significant voices uh, in this discussion because they're worried about their safety and security and the fact that Iran is still marching uh, its way to nuclear weapons uh, and making threats to blow Israel off the map, regardless of the fact that they're at the table uh, to negotiate a deal in Vienna. Look, it's very surprising that they didn't strike a deal, frankly, because uh, for those of us who have been watching this closely, it looked like the enthusiasm with which the United States and uh, the other uh, world partners that were sitting at the table with the Iranian regime wanted this very, very badly. They were enthusiastic. They wanted to push it through. Uh, here in the United States, it's been uncovered that uh, the Biden administration has secretly been canceling the sanctions against Iran, has been letting them off the hook with the Houthis in Yemen, letting them off the hook in Syria, letting them off the hook in many, many different sectors to allow this or give them some breathing space in order to incentivize making a deal and striking that deal. So the fact that, the, that, that everyone's watching away from this meeting with nothing uh, really accomplished is pretty surprising. Now, also add to this that we have an election uh, in Iran. There's a new president there who's a, a, an extreme hardliner. So he's flexing his muscles and saying, we're not getting back into a deal unless all the sanctions are wiped. So a lot of ultimatums are being thrown around. No deal was struck at, uh, in Vienna, and the meeting has been adjourned. Lisa, a report from the Jerusalem Post says Iran's nuclear power plant had an emergency shutdown. Now, witnesses say they've seen dozens of fires and explosions across the country tied to these nuclear power plants. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the question now is, you know, they don't allow the news to come out about their power plants as easily uh, anymore because they are fearful that it could be either perceived as or actually be an attack from Israel. So if you remember just a few months ago, we had uh, the Boucher power plant that was struck with a cyber attack from the Israeli government. Obviously, the Israeli government is keeping tabs on the progress of their weapons program in Iran, uh, not allowing them to get past a certain level because we know what their intentions are once they do get to that level, regardless of what they say. Uh, it's not for peaceful purposes, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, the fact that, that we're seeing these fires across uh, their plants, either they're not being careful or this may be another act of sabotage. Now, while kids here in North America look forward to summer camps of horseback riding, little archery, maybe making crafts, Hamas is hosting summer military camps teaching kids what? How to make bombs and become the next terrorist operatives? Exactly. This is their recruitment program. Start them young. Uh, now, this has been going on for years and years. I mean, I've been 
you know, following this for more than probably two decades. I remember reporting this in, in college um, as, as one of my projects on terrorism because it is such a startling story. Not just these summer camps, but their textbooks and the songs they sing as kids, as toddlers. They are taught about becoming martyrs and killing Jews and bloodshed. Spilling the blood of the enemy is a quote that's repeated very often in these songs. And to take these young children and to fill their minds with so much hatred at such a young age and then expect them as adults, you know, to make peace with their neighbors, to live side by side, to acknowledge a Jewish state of Israel. It's almost impossible. We have to stop this at the root to say, you know, Hamas cannot be in power. I mean, if the U United States uh, is willing to give so much money to the Palestinians, there should be some ultimatums. There should be a, a, a condition uh, that a terror organization cannot lead a people that is threatening our ally in the region, Israel. Uh, you know, this is, uh, and I'm, I'm very glad you, you brought this to light, Hal, because this isn't being reported everywhere. So the past month where we saw these, uh, this conflict escalate between Hamas and Israel, and you have people like the Hadids and other celebrities taking the side of these terrorists against a sovereign state, uh, our ally in the region, Israel, uh, then you wonder, you know, uh, where are they getting their information from, first of all? And secondly, it's such a shame that they have this influence under uh, over people who have no, no information, no knowledge about what's going on in the region. So I thank you for bringing this to light to understand the hatred that is being used against the, these children, the child abuse that exists, the sexism that exists against women, the fact that they are, you know, they marginalize all sorts of minorities, all sorts of human rights abuses. And you know what? The left here in this country celebrates the Palestinians and they celebrate Hamas and they, you know, they're, they're all for it. They're cheering this as though it's color war, Israel against Hamas and not understanding the underlying pinnings, which you just brought to light. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the kids don't stand much of a chance when their brainwashing starts at such an early age. Lisa, the president of Afghanistan, will be visiting Washington on Friday. I'm guessing it has something to do with the U.S. withdrawal of troops. Yes, this is a, a very timely uh, and surprising, I should say, meeting between the two. Look, Afghanistan um, will be coming to uh, the, the White House on Friday, but they will be coming in, in a pair. The uh, interim uh, peacemaking uh, liaison, he's basically meant to bring the country together in this transition time and the president. And these two kind of squared off in 2014 to share power. And it didn't really work very well, but they struck another deal in May of 2020 to work side by side. And now they will be traveling to the White House together to talk about the future of Afghanistan once the U.S. does pull out in September and on September 11th. Uh, and and uh, we shall see what kind of, of meeting this is. I'm sure the, the Afghanis are very upset, not only about the state of their, their country, but about the U.S. pullout, about losing the support, uh, the physical support on the ground of the U.S. Uh, and having to fend for themselves against the Taliban and all of the suicide bombings and terror attacks that are still going on there. And the Afghani president says the United States legacy in his country is a total disgrace and disaster. Yes, this was an interview with uh, Karzai, the former president of Afghanistan, uh, on Sunday talk show where he says, don't even talk to me about the United States. We, you know, persona non grata. No one wants to talk about the United States. It's a total failure, total disgrace. Um, they're pretty upset. And let's see what happens uh, if this is a constructive uh, meeting that happens at the White House. But, you know, we're, we're at an age, if, if we learned anything from the Putin and Biden meeting, that it's all about the facade again. You know, under the Trump presidency, we saw some, some some real transparency. Um, and I, ironically, this administration that begged for transparency, demanded transparency, uh, we're back to the facade and the, you know, the fake smiles and the fake handshakes, but we really don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Israel's foreign minister will soon be traveling to the United Arab Emirates, marking the first time an Israeli minister has visited the country since relations between the two were normalized last year. Yes, this is for all the naysayers about the Abraham Accords. Look at this deal and how the uh, significant changes it has made in, in terms of politics, geopolitics, the economy, all of it. Uh, this is real. It's not just a piece of paper or, or a, you know, a, a silly handshake like we saw between Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat on the White House lawn under Bill Clinton's uh, presidency. This is real. And uh, it's wonderful to see that there has been such a crossover and a collaboration between the 
UAE and Israel, as well as Bahrain and the other nations, but the UAE and Israel more so, uh, where they have had you know business dealings, uh, private and public both, I, a lot of tourism. We even saw an Orthodox Jewish wedding uh, in Dubai. Uh, it's, it's really a wonderful thing to see. And hopefully this will be the future of the Middle East. More modern Arab states will join them. Uh, and, and this will be the, 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 the ones who don't get along and want to cause trouble and want to terrorize Israel will be in the minority. And these Arab nations will be hopefully in the majority. Yeah, praying for peace in the Middle East each and every day. Lisa, the BBC is reporting that Palestinians have canceled a vaccine swap deal with Israel. Now, three countries have asked Israel for the vaccines the Palestinians simply don't want. Obviously, right? So, so many of these nations are waiting for vaccines. Here, the, the Palestinians are getting these vaccines on a silver platter, and they're like, no, 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 no. Because it, it, it disturbs the narrative, Hal. It disturbs the narrative that we are the victims and Israel is the aggressor. Now that, right, you know, after this conflict that they had, Israel is offering them a million vaccines, and they use the excuse that they will soon expire. Well, what, what happens when you get the COVID vaccine? You start administering them right away, day one. Day one, there's no reason to wait on them or to allow it to reach its its expiration date, which they claim is, is very, very soon. So they said deal canceled on Friday night. They made the announcement. And now Israel says, listen, we have other people who want this deal and we'll, we'll have to clear it with Pfizer. But once we do, um, we will we will have to talk with new partners. And the Palestinians uh, said no deal. Then we want an investigation into these vaccines. What were they? When were they set to expire? This is awful. This is really awful. You know, if you care more about the narrative and the PR campaign more than the health and the the uh, well-being of your citizens, then we have a problem. It appears as though the Tokyo Olympics will be moving ahead, but a Ugandan has tested positive for COVID-19 in Japan. What will this mean for the Games? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting because there have been so many calls to cancel the games, um, so many calls to postpone the games, and they went ahead with it. So we already uh, overcame so many different obstacles, and obviously COVID being this you know, this cloud that hangs over every single aspect of our lives these days now has come to the Olympic Games. So this individual has been uh, marked. He has been uh, put under... Um, basically uh, quarantine so that he can stay safe and not affect others. But uh, it's going to be something that they're going to be worried about going forward. Lisa, LinkedIn is blocking profiles from being viewed inside of China if they mention politically sensitive topics such as the Tiananmen Square massacre. Tell me more. Yeah, so no surprise here. Uh, China has played the censorship game for very, very long. Uh, they have blocked out any media channel, uh, newspaper, uh, online source, individual dissidents, and now LinkedIn profiles. When people want to uh, not only go to Facebook or Instagram for news, but uh, post it on LinkedIn, they won't be able to. So it's going to use buzzwords uh, like Tiananmen Square, uh, like some of the other uh, human rights abuses that are going on in China. Uh, if, they're, if they make their government not look so flattering, then they will be canceled. They will be censored. People won't be able to view it. Now, it's interesting we're talking about China because we have that same issue here in the United States. Both the media and big tech, the same two issues that we just talked about with, with China, is going on here in the United States. Remember when you couldn't talk about COVID, you couldn't talk about uh, medications and, and ways to cure COVID, you couldn't talk about the vaccine or any theory that you have about where COVID originated because you would have that little label or it would be blocked on Instagram and on Facebook and on other social media platforms. Uh, so, you know, it's it's going on everywhere. We have to have a, a, a bigger, a more macro conversation about what the responsibility of these um big tech companies are with regards to information, the, the dissemination of information uh, and censorship. I mean, it's how about, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, all of that. We're going backwards, Hal. Yeah, it sure <laughs> seems that way. Absolutely. Lisa, speaking of China, let's talk about the trade war between the United States and China, two of the big superpowers here. Have things changed or it's still a tit for tat when it comes to tariffs since the Biden administration took over? You know, the Biden administration hasn't been able to do much on China. Uh, you know, it, it seemed like when they came roaring in, it's like, OK, you know, President Trump ruined everything with China with the tariffs coming on too strong. And now we have this COVID situation and, you know, you should leave China alone and don't call it the China virus and stop pushing them for uh, the origins of the COVID um, pandemic. And, you know, it, 
the conversation kind of halted there. Now you have the Biden administration in the White House. And again, we're seeing, you know, this this surge in this curiosity of like, how about we hold China accountable? How about some transparency? How about we call them out on their human rights abuses uh, against the Uyghurs uh, and all of that? So, you know, nothing has changed. I think China has become a bit more confident in its ability to carry on this way, right? We're seeing that with their muscle flexing, whether it's in the seas or with, you know, beefing up their military or their cyber military. Uh, so things haven't changed. Maybe the wording has changed, but nothing has uh, actually changed in terms of the future of how to curb China, how to move forward and to at least compete with them. I know there was a recently um, at, at the G7, the message there was, guys, wake up. We have to compete with China. We have to really uh, step it up if we want to at least be on par with them in the future. Speaking of Asian nations, if anything, has anything really changed when it comes to North Korea in the United States? No. Any meetings yeah, potentially set up again with Biden and Kim? No, it seems like there's been less transparency. Um, there's been no talks of uh, or se of setting a date. Uh, I know North Korea has uh, tried to make its way into the headlines by doing some missile tests. They bragged about the success of their missile tests not too long ago. So um, they're on the radar in terms of one of the rogue nations that the U.S. has to watch out for. Uh, but no changes have been made. Again, the boogeyman man is out of the White House, but we haven't seen any uh, diplomacy or any other tactics used in bringing the North Koreans or the Chinese or the Russians closer to the United States using diplomacy. Foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari, thanks again for your time today and joining us from Los Angeles. My pleasure. Well, it's been a long haul for many Southern Alberta businesses. Will the economy recover with the lifting of restrictions this summer? And will it last? Joining me to discuss the Southern Alberta economic situation is Trevor Lewington, CEO of Economic Development Lethbridge. Trevor, welcome once again to the show. Thanks for having me back. Great to be here. Absolutely. So, Trevor, first of all, do we have any numbers on how many Lethbridge businesses have actually closed their doors due to COVID? How bad is it? Yeah, we know some businesses certainly didn't make it through the pandemic and there have been some closures. The challenge for us is that there aren't any really great numbers to use as yet. So bankruptcies, as an example, we use business bankruptcies as a bit of a way to measure that. They're about the same as they were for the last two years, but we know it can take six to 12 months for bankruptcies to show up in the system. So hopefully government supports that were out there for you know rent subsidy, wage subsidy have helped most businesses uh, get through the pandemic. And right now, business licenses for new businesses in the city of Lethbridge at least have rebounded. So we're pretty wow. optimistic, hopefully, that we won't see too much pain and suffering. That is that is a little bit of good news there, absolutely. So have you heard how the surrounding Southern Alberta communities are doing? Are they doing any better or worse than Lethbridge? Yeah, we see economic data, for example, from cities like Medicine Hat that we know is struggling a little bit more so than we are. They're a little bit more reliant on oil and gas, as an example. Lethbridge has a slightly more diversified economy. But the surrounding region and everything that we've seen so far, it seems to be pretty positive. Most municipal governments received extra funding last year from the provincial government that should help municipalities. And we haven't seen any major closures or major sort of economic changes in the surrounding region. So, so far, so good. Mm -hmm. So owners of restaurants, gyms, theaters, hair salons, et cetera, of course, they're all excited to be open uh, back up once again. But I understand that one of the challenges is that these kinds of businesses are having a tough time finding workers to fill those job vacancies. So is this because some individuals are choosing to stay home and receive government COVID benefits instead? Well, we do an annual survey of the business community and every year workforce is always at the top of the list. So Lethbridge has historically struggled to find the right numbers and, qual and amounts of qualified workers. So that's a challenge across all industries. We also understand that a lot of people during the pandemic decided to go back to school. So that could be a partial explanation. People taking a lot of online learning opportunities since they were, you know, boarded up at home anyway. Uh, but we do know that certainly there's a bit of a concern in terms of people being able to hire and find the right number of uh, staff to run their businesses. So that's something we're going to have to watch very closely moving forward. Mm -hmm, definitely. Now, some say that workers may be hesitant to go back to work and customers may not be flocking back to stores right away out of lingering fears of catching COVID. So what have you been hearing about this? 
We're definitely hearing that from both customers who are hesitant to go back to businesses like a movie theater, as an example. Uh, certainly some employers of noted staff are struggling with the concept of going back and whether or not they'll feel protected. So it's definitely a legitimate issue. I guess what I would say is that for businesses, there are steps they can take, of course, to protect their workers, whether it's personal protective equipment or you know, voluntary masking, even if, even if there's no provincial mandate, people could still choose to wear a mask. And we don't want to forget the things we've learned during the pandemic, you know, better hygiene around washing our hands and keeping our distance from people, staying home when we're sick. So I think we just have to reinforce those things. And a reminder to consumers that if you're concerned about going to a particular type of business, maybe it's a restaurant, have that conversation with the business. Phone the restaurant, find out what precautions they're taking and make sure you ask, you know, ask those tough questions rather than just make an assumption that perhaps it's not safe. So we're seeing vaccination rates rise. We're seeing the province, you know, quote unquote, open for summer according to the province's plan. But if people have concerns, they should ask questions and talk to a healthcare professional and find out more. Yeah, absolutely. I like what you were saying that hopefully this uh, reinforces the hand washing and the, the better hygiene and stuff. So if anything was to come out of COVID, maybe that's the one positive, right? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Now, is Alberta finally seeing a bit of a rebound in oil and gas prices? I know gas prices shot up a bit last week or so, but are we seeing more of an evening out now? We have seen oil and gas prices increase. Certainly there's volatility in the market. Uh, and we're all feeling the pain at the pumps, unfortunately, or watching our you know monthly natural gas bills. But that's really good news for the province. That means additional revenues uh, for government coffers. That means there's additional royalty income. So as long as that's sustainable and uh, sort of at least for the medium term stays at those levels, the provincial government will be happy. There should be uh, additional funds available. Of course, it puts additional pressure on consumers. And right now, the medium term forecast is for oil and gas to stay roughly where it is. This isn't a short term blip. We expect the prices to stabilize around this level, at least for now. Mm -hmm. Now, even though our economy here in Lethbridge isn't necessarily dependent on oil, are there any thoughts on how this could affect us one way or another? Yeah, as the old adage goes, wherever oil and gas goes, Alberta follows. And certainly, you know, the impact of the oil and gas sector on the province is significant. So it's good news for all of Alberta, including Lethbridge, when oil and gas recovers. But we have to remember there's a number of Lethbridge manufacturers and service companies that sell to the oil and gas sector. So they certainly feel the pain even here in Lethbridge when that sector contracts or suspends capital spending and big projects. So any increase is good news for the whole province, but certainly there are Lethbridge companies that will benefit as well. Mm -hmm. Now, some other good news is that the unemployment rate for Lethbridge Medicine Hat region has, it keeps dropping. So I believe it was at 7.3% for May. So how does Lethbridge compare with other cities uh, across Alberta? Yeah, the Lethbridge Medicine Hat region has one of the lowest unemployment rates in the province. So that's great news in the sense that we're a better performing market compared to the rest of Alberta. And if you look at the city of Lethbridge itself, it's even a lower number than that. So the city itself is performing far better than the region from an unemployment perspective. So that's good. The challenge in the last two months is that it's actually been because of a drop in the participation rate. So what that means is people are actually leaving the workforce, potentially retirements, potentially people going back to school. But rather than having actually more jobs in the economy in the last couple of months, it meant more people stopped looking for work. So that's a bit of a concern to us. The number is a bit misleading. So it's something we'll have to keep an eye on very closely. Interesting. Now, do you think that COVID had something to do with that, with, uh, with people kind of being home and it, had, uh, the, it gave them a chance to think about doing other things maybe? Like you said, going back to school or finding other careers altogether. Yeah, it's a guess at this point, but certainly there have been disruptions in traditional industries like accommodation and food service. All of those public health restrictions meant many hotels and restaurants were either closed or operating at very reduced staff levels. So it may have prompted people just to rethink their career path and, and do something different. And perhaps they're, they're taking a break or they've decided to do something else. Um, you know, the good news, if we look at this year compared to a year ago, both unemployment is improved and participation is improved as well. So the workforce did increase. There are overall more jobs now than a year ago. But like I said, we're just concerned about that little trend in the last couple of months of the workforce, people sort of seeming to 
to leave. So we'll just have to make sure we pay attention to that. Yeah, definitely. And that does make a lot of sense. Now, what is Leopard looking like when it comes to holding a summer events, assuming that the province opens everything back up, which we are supposed to come July 1st. So that's very exciting. So what about things like whoop up days and Nika Yuka Japanese gardens, concerts, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, we're hearing uh, mixed messages. So the city itself has chosen not to have official Canada Day celebrations in part because of the pandemic. And more importantly, I think the, the, the limited time that was allowed for planning once those restrictions were lifted. Yes. Other surrounding communities near us, so the town of Raymond, for example, is moving forward with their heritage days that are largely over the Canada Day timeframe. We know Exhibition Park is working on some version of whoop-up days. It will be modified, of course, but they are looking to bring that event here the Japanese gardens are open. Nikayuko is hosting a number of events. And there are a number of other festivals. So the Lethbridge Electronic Music Festival, for example, is moving forward. So I think people just need to pay attention uh, to the news and sort of keep track of different websites. There will be events throughout the summer. Some are, in fact, cancelled, but many are being modified or hosted in a different way. So there will be lots to do around the Lethbridge region uh, for the whole summer, which is exciting. That is very good news, absolutely. Now, do you think that Southern Alberta sports fans are ready to come out and fully support baseball and rodeos? Well, I've, I heard anecdotally that, of course, the, the first Bulls game the season over was very busy over at Spitz Stadium. I know the Lethbridge Hurricanes are excited to get back to a regular 68-game season come the fall. So I think people are definitely excited to get outside and get back you know, to doing physical activities. And for the most part, it sounds like uh, even sort of junior leagues are moving forward with games and seasons, even if they're, again, slightly modified or slightly shortened. So, again, I think that when it comes to sports, there'll be lots for people to get out and be active and lots to do as well. Mm -hmm. Now, what feedback are you getting from the agriculture and manufacturing sector? How are things looking? Very strong, actually. So 2020, of course, was the heart of the pandemic, largest economic crisis uh, globally since the Great Depression, but the Lethbridge region actually saw exports rise. So our manufacturing and agriculture sectors grew exports by just over 10%. That's a very significant gain. And that is definitely opposite the provincial trend. So exports leaving Alberta to other destinations were down, but the Lethbridge region was up 10%. So we're very excited by that number. I think it underscores our strength in food and agriculture and sort of manufactured goods. And at the end of the day, whether there's an economic crisis or not, people still need to eat. So I guess that un underscores the strength of our region, which is, which is, again, very good news. Well, there you go. Now, has there been a significant slowdown in new businesses opening up because of COVID? I know you mentioned earlier on in the interview that you're seeing business licenses being applied for. So that, that, that's good news. But, but it, it, does it look like we might see an increase in new business ventures now that things are opening up again? Or did you see that slowdown because of COVID? Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, we definitely saw a slowdown in the number of new businesses, like business licenses being requested, but that number has since bounced back. We're basically back to where we were. So I think that's a good sign of people having an interest in launching their business or doing something. I think we have seen an interest in real estate. We have seen commercial real estate transactions in the city move up. So both leases and sales, which of course we're looking for to see what the business sentiment is. Those things have gone up. We've seen pricing relatively stable in commercial real estate. So there seems to be a lot of activity. Uh, thinking about my organization, we do, of course, investment attraction to the city. And although there has been a lot of interest, people were waiting to make decisions, but the pipeline's pretty full. There's a number of exciting projects on the horizon that if we can deliver those, uh, that will have a positive impact as well. So I remain very optimistic for Lethbridge's uh, opportunities in the near term. That's fantastic. Can you give us a, any fearless predictions on where the Lethbridge economy is headed over the next six months, Trevor? Yeah, I think overall Lethbridge will do quite well. Uh, we have a very strong base and a fairly diversified economy. As I said, exports and agriculture and manufacturing are up. That's very good news. Where there's some risk, of course, is our public sector. So Lethbridge disproportionately has a higher number of people employed in both healthcare and the post-secondary sector. And the province has signaled that the you know as the pandemic and the, the managing that crisis passes, they will return back to a budget of austerity and trying to get their financial house in order. So the risk for us in Lethbridge is that those government cuts tend to, dis to disproportionately affect the local economy because we have so many people employed in those two sectors. The other thing that's on the horizon, I think, as people will have noticed in their pocketbook, whether they're buying lumber for that new deck or perhaps they're filling up their car, is inflation. 
We've seen higher than normal inflation uh, affect everyone and across a broad number of goods. And I, I expect to see that probably for the next year. It's probably going to stay that way for some time. And that's going to put pressure both on consumers as they spend, but also on interest rates. And we're, we're at a point where consumers have never been carrying more household debt. So any increase in the interest rates, which could come to control inflation, puts people at risk. So, you know, my advice to people is think very carefully about their purchases, think very carefully about the next year. And if they can pay down debt and make sure they've got that and um, got some flexibility as things shift in the coming months. Great advice. Thanks so much for being with us today, Trevor. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. Absolutely. Trevor Lewington is the CEO of Economic Development Lethbridge. I'm Jeanette Roche. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks for watching.